Welcome to Tycoons of Small Biz, a podcast where small business owners are celebrated as the backbone of the American economy. Each week, we introduce you to tycoons who share their stories and advice so that small business owners may learn from their experiences. Tycoons is powered by Backbone Planning Partners, Intrepid Solutions, and Pivotal Advisors. Join us now as our hosts connect you to today's tycoons. Good afternoon, tycoons, and welcome to Tycoons of Small Biz. I am your host today alongside the model-esque uh, Ryan Weissmuller from Intrepid Solutions. And we have a really cool, unique guest today on the show, and that is Mr. Tersh Blissett. Ryan and Tersh, thanks for being here, guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Fun as always. Yep, absolutely. Before we kick things off, I, I wanted just to take a moment to uh, give a shout out to uh, your main host, and our brother, Austin Peterson, yesterday morning, his uh, dad passed away after a uh, battle with cancer. So just wanted to uh, push our thoughts and our prayers and love out to uh, him. Of course, the rest of his family, primarily his mom, who uh, was married to him for uh, over 40 years. So hard to uh, think about not being married to somebody after they pass when you've spent most of your life with them. So. We love you, brother. Uh, we're thinking about you, and uh, we'll look forward to having you back on the show here in the next week or two. So, all right. So, Tycoons, uh, today we've got a guest that is not only a small business guru, he's a three a three piece suit wearing backwards hat type of guy. Came up in the industry, uh, worked as a technician. Uh, before that, was in the armed services. So, we want to. Make sure we take our, our hats off and and uh, thank him for that. Church, before we get into any of that stuff, man, thank you for being here again. And tell us about yourself as an individual. Tell us about your family, your upbringing, you know, your education, anything that's important to you, you know, in your personal life. And then naturally that will tie into, you know, what you're up to today uh, business-wise. Oh, man. I don't know if we have enough time for all that. Uh, <laughs> it's... Uh... I definitely latchkey kid, very self-reliant. I was the oldest of six. Mom was in medical school pretty much my entire childhood. That's all I remember was her in, in college. Uh, and so I pretty much fended for everybody. Right out of high school, went to college. Uh, well, I joined the the Air National Guard and, and was in there and was doing college. I actually did college in high school also, but then got out of there, went to work at an industrial plant with uh, mechanical engineering degree, really did not like it at all. I just despised the entire process. I was really good at math, and that's why I went to Georgia Tech. I mean, I was just, it was a natural flow. My mom was a lifelong, she's been in school. She's still in school. She's getting another She's getting another doctorate. So she's, she's that person. So she's always pushed me to stay in college and stuff like that. And I'll probably have that debt for the rest of my life because then after I started my second uh, business, I went back to school for uh, psychology so that I could better understand the thought process with my my team and help uh, better coach them. Long story short, I left that chemical plant and uh, was working. I had a buddy of mine. I'm a, I'm a car guy. I have a I, I wear a three piece suit, but I have a full sleeve of tattoos. I have twelve cars. I'm a gearhead through and through. And a buddy of mine who was also a gearhead, he would hang out at my house all the time. I knew he dropped out of high school at 16, but this guy had always had money. He was always, we would compete me with an engineering degree and that was my life. And he was a trades guy. And I'm like, dude, I don't know what you got going on, but I don't like what I'm doing. I want to do what you're doing. And uh, he said, I can get you a, an interview. I can't guarantee you a job. But uh, he did. He, he got me an interview, and I started working for an air conditioning company, not knowing anything about air conditioning. Actually, my dad uh, had told me probably six months prior to that that I needed to get into the trades. He had mentioned getting into electrical, and I was like, I ain't trying to die. I don't want to get shot with electricity. So, <laughs> uh, but then I ended up in the air conditioning field, um, and it was by mistake. 
but then it, I was instantly hooked. The instant gratification that you get with fixing service, fixing air conditionings on each service call, it was just a natural uh, high for me. The number side of things, I was really curious how the business worked, even though I was in the field. And so within two years, I was a service manager. And then within another two years, I was general manager and installation manager. And I mean, I worked through all of the different uh, gamuts of it. And then I got bored. And that was when I realized that I was a wartime leader. When things got really smooth, that's just, I'm out, deuces. So that's the reason why I still own two air conditioning companies, two plumbing companies, and an electrical company, because as soon as that company starts to run on its own, I next shiny object. And it's to a fault sometimes, but it's really allowed me to really try out different things. Started the podcast in 2017, had a lot of people asking me, well, how do you start a business? And I was like, you know, I'm glad for punishment. Let me start another one. So I started another one and I actually ended up buying one that was in really, really bad shape. And I was, all right, listeners, you're going to follow along as I try and bring this business out of the really bad pits that it's in uh, and hopefully make it successful. And uh, that's what we did. We grew it about 600% over the period of two years. And that's where we're at today. So a lot to unpack there. Uh, let me throw this out so I don't forget to ask you about it as a follow-up. But you said this business was really in a in a bad spot. So I want to I want to ask you to elaborate on that. You know why why was it in a bad spot? What what exactly made it um, to be where it was at? And then what did you do to turn that around? Because I think there's definitely some value in hearing what you have to say there. But before we dive into that. Two things. Talk to our listeners and our viewers. What's up with the three-piece suit? And what's up with the background that we are looking at? Because there's a lot going on there. You got some black lights and some fluorescent stuff going on. It looks super cool, but tell us what's going on with those two things. If it's normal, I do the exact opposite. So if a plumber wears a t-shirt and blue jeans, I'm going to get in the attic with the three-piece suit air conditioning guys like it's 145 degrees there's no way i'm putting on anything other than a t-shirt or something like that I'm like you know what i'll prove you i can do it and not only that it's the fact that when i get out of the truck and, and we walk up because all of my guys they don't wear three-piece suits but they're all wearing khaki pants and and black polo shirts um and orange undershirts everybody matches and it's very I mean, we, it's on purpose, everything that we do. If you look in the background, you can see Carl, my mannequin. He's got the our actual uniform on back there. Um, and so it it's one of those things where if it's normal, I do the exact opposite. You can't stand out if you're just like everybody else. And that's, the, that's just the thing that, and I wear a hat backwards because as this just happened by mistake a couple of years ago because of all my lighting in my office. When I wear a hat forward, it shadows all my my eyes, my my wonderful features. Because my mom's always told me I had a face for radio, but uh, I try to try to prove it wrong as much as possible. But uh, so I, I started turning my hat around backwards, and it kind of stuck. And the podcast we go live at least once a week, and so I just wanted to make sure it was a background that people could really remember remember it and. The books that I have, I mean, I've read all those books two or three times, four times, maybe. Some of those books I'm actually featured in, which I was like, I don't know why someone would do that, but it was cool. So I kept them. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's that. Would you like for me to talk about the business that I purchased? Yes, I would. I want to just make a quick comment, though. Yeah. So I read a book a few months ago. You know who Mike Michalowicz is? Yeah. If you so, look real close, you can see Profit First and uh a few other ones in there. But yeah. Have you, so have you have you read Get Different yet? I have. have oh, you, you have. Okay. I love that book. I love Mike. We actually had him on the podcast last year, <laughs> the year before. That guy's a big old ball of energy. Yeah, he is. He is. Have absolutely. you read Fix This Next? I have. Okay. Yep. So the business that I turned around was one of the businesses that was in Fix This Next. No way. 
Yep. So this, the story that you're about to tell us right now is actually a story in Fix This Next. Yep, it is. <laughs> wow. That's, uh, that's interesting. All right, well, how about it? I wish it was really elaborate and something super amazing, but it's really simple. I purchased this business right when I first started hanging out with Mike and he invited me up to Jersey and we did some, he was trying to get the the foundation built around fix this next, the whole concept. I really was like, Mike, I'll do whatever it takes to help you out because I had literally have this business that I'm purchasing. I have another business that runs on its own and pays the bills. This business is kind of a, a toy, but at the same time, I want to make sure that it's, it is a viable business so that the listening audience doesn't follow me down this dead end road. You know what I mean? And so uh, Mike was like, all right, cool. I'm going to use you as a case study. And so it was every other week, Mike and I were talking about just little things. And what it ultimately boiled boiled down to was uh, determining our avatar and really focusing on catering to our perfect avatar and learning how to say no. Because the other business, uh, it showed a lot more money, revenue on the books. The profits were not there because of the clientele was really demanding. So it was super labor heavy. Essentially, I fired everybody that was that that we serviced, changed up our whole mentality, went from very low margin, high volume to high margin, low volume, and really spent time and caring about the client. Uh, so much so that I'm an automation guru. Also, like I love automation. And one of the things that we do is, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Savannah Bananas. If you if if you read Profit First, Mike McCallowitz talks about Jesse Cole and Savannah Bananas and how they got their, their start and everything. Well, we changed out an air conditioning unit for them. And just through automation that we had built. And I forgot about it. I mean, I knew about it, but I, it didn't register that this was going to even happen. Jared is the president of the Savannah Bananas and his wife, uh, she was pregnant. I mean, pregnant, pregnant, like nine and a half months pregnant. And uh, she got a phone call from Miss Mary, who is our masseuse. And she's, she's who takes care of, she's not a masseuse. She doesn't like being called that, but I always screw it up. She's the one who, she gives mobile massages. And every time someone, we put in an air conditioning unit for someone, we don't tell them about this, but Mary calls them and says, hey, I just want to call and schedule a time to come out and give you your massage, compliments of Service Emperor, to help de-stress during a stressful time for you. And she was pregnant and just super stressed out. And just the baby was coming and uh, Mary goes and gives her her prenatal massage and Jared's just over the moon. She calls Jared crying and it's like, I can't believe they did this for us and all this other stuff. And Jared calls me and he's like, man, you just don't know how much of an impact that you made on us and our family. And for Jared and those guys at Savannah Bananas who do the most outlandish things for their customer base, for him to be surprised, I was like, all right, cool. We're on the right track. Like we're just going to wow all of our customers the only way we could afford to do that is to spend a little bit more time with the clientele and, and charge a little bit more. And it was wrapping our heads around that whole concept of people will pay for the value as long as it's perceived value. And we have a thing where we send out balloons on the anniversary of, or the birthday of the air conditioning units. And it's just little things like that, that it's just, it just uh, going above and beyond and wow and customer service, you know, wow's that's one of our core, core values, um, wow service. And so the other air conditioning company that I have, we grew between 90 and 120% year over year, but we were very, very low margin, extremely high volume. And so that's what I knew. I knew how to do, you know, four and a half million at 15% net with doing that running and gunning just as fast as you can on to the next customer. We went from 12 service calls a day to three service calls a day and making the same profits, less headaches and, and all that good jazz. Tersh, you, you brought up a, a really interesting point and I, and I know a lot of your work with the podcast is how to support you know, these, these new up and coming service businesses. And, and certainly we'll, we'll circle back and talk about that in a minute, but 
the, the concept of, of saying no. And, and Lynn and I both have the pleasure of working with a lot of small and mid-sized growing businesses. And, and I, I know I find that's something very hard for a lot of businesses to do, especially as they're in that growth mode. What, what do you think the secret is? And, and, and certainly, again, you interact with a lot of these companies yourselves. How do you get your mindset around doing that? Because it is really a key to unlocking growth. But I think it's one of the hardest things to do in business. It is so hard. I mean, so hard. Whenever your board's not full and then the person calls in and you just know that person's going to give you a fit, but you can go catch that call. You can change out that system, but that that's going to be a problem for the next five years. And you can make the money right now, but you're going to have the headache in the future. And it until you've experienced it, it's like, the guy that that's in the truck. Okay. So, uh, service emperor, the company that, uh, I originally purchased it, it was called icebound. When I purchased that company, I said from day one, I will never be in the truck. Like I'm not going to be in the truck. I have a state license and everything. Like I can do it all, but I purposely did not want to be in the truck and I wanted to run it remotely. If it's normal, I was doing the exact opposite. And so people ask, well, it's, all the time, the exact same thing. Like, how do you say no? And how do you run a business without getting in the truck? Because I can have two trucks sitting in the front and it would be very easy for me to jump in a truck, go catch some service calls, make $200,000 for the company in a couple of weeks and call it good. But what I'm not doing is I'm not growing and I'm not, I'm not dreaming about the business whenever I'm doing that, I'm dreaming about getting off of work at that point. So at the same time, once you've experienced saying no, it's, it's such a hard con and, and I still fall in the trap of, of not saying no from time to time. And every time my wife and I will talk about this every single time I don't say no, we just laugh at ourselves and we're like, we knew we should have said no, that's not our avatar. And we knew it wasn't our avatar from from the get go, we knew it wasn't, but we still, you know, bleeding heart syndrome. We took them as a client. And then next thing you know, it's always the ones that you try and help out. Then it comes back and ends up costing you a ton of money, which it, it's done. And, and once you can understand that you, every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. And it's the exact opposite. If you'll say no, then you have the ability to say yes to other things. And once that aha realization happens, then it's like, okay, I'm okay with saying no and just trusting that I did everything else correctly and the calls are going to come in. I, I, I love what you said there because I think it's a great lesson for all business owners is I'm not getting in the truck. It, we, we all have our own trucks that we need to oh, stay yeah. out. I, I love that advice. It's tough. It is so hard. I mean, I had a guy that, that came in and, and we hired him and less than a week, he's, he was like, this is just not for me. We are not normal. And I try to explain that to people because even our hiring practices are not normal. Whenever we get in a hiring event, it's a Zoom call with 20 other people. And you have no idea that there's going to be 20 other people in your interview when you get on, when you start the interview process. And I ask every, every single person the same exact four questions. You just have to wow me in front of all these. And you're interviewing with technicians, you know, installers, CSRs, everything. And it's just not normal. I, I like to see how you react for the, throughout that diversity. Whenever he, he came in and he was like, this just isn't for me. Like, man, I really... I hate that you went through the process of leaving your past job to come. And I wish that you understood. I wish that I explained it better. It's definitely a learning thing for me uh, to make sure that I explain everything properly uh, for the future. But if something ever happens and you change your mind, don't hesitate to come back. And I don't know. It's just like, you just have to be okay with, with it not being normal. I mean, it's obviously, it's easy to talk about when it's successful <laughs> and it's not so easy to talk about whenever it's not successful. Uh, and it was not always successful for us, but we're okay with other things. And, and I try to be as open as on and honest as possible. Cause like our entire business is remote. Our office staff is all remote. We have a virtual zoom that stays up on our screens at all times we call it our virtual cubicles. And 
So we talk about this a lot with followers of the podcast or whatever, uh, friends of mine. And they're like, you can't have a virtual office. I'm like I can show you how I do it and it is successful, but yeah, I can also tell you exactly how to fail at it too, because I've done that as well. And, and so you have to be willing to accept the fact that there's not only one way to do things. And like Edison said about the light bulb, I didn't fail a thousand times. I just learned a thousand times, a thousand ways not to make light bulb, you know? <laughs> You you use the term avatar a couple of times. I think most of us probably know what that is, but for some people that are listening that don't know what you're talking about, talk to us about what is an avatar exactly and why why is it something that every single business needs, whether you're a solopreneur or a hundred million dollar a year revenue business, why does every single business need an avatar? You have to know where to target because if you if you target everyone, you're targeting no one. And it's one of those things where it's like, okay, that competitor is doing Facebook ads. Let me do Facebook ads. That competitor is doing radio. Let me do radio. This competitor is doing television. Let me try television out for a little bit. You don't know why they're doing television. Their target audience may be 40 to 60 years old, watch the news every single night at 6 p.m. That's why they target those individuals. Your target audience may be millennials who only scroll on Facebook or whatever, Snapchat and, you know, TikTok. They never watch six o'clock news. So you've completely wasted all of the that marketing revenue. Also your message, like I know who my avatar is and I know typically what they are receptive to hearing when it comes to marketing and and digital marketing radio whatever so if you don't know you're it's just guessing it's just a guesswork and your avatar is not just your audience you need to have an avatar for your employees and your team members as well so knowing your perfect team members and that's when you're running a 100 percent remote business where you don't come in and you hang out with each other for an hour every single morning and bump shoulders and rub elbows you have to know who can and can't do that kind of work. And so you don't run, end up in a situation like I was in the other day where I hired the wrong person and it was, this guy didn't fit my avatar. I knew he didn't fit my avatar when he was sitting right next to me when we were onboarding. But I was honest, I mean, at that point, we were too far along in the conversation and like I definitely was going to do whatever it took to help him stay on board with us. I uh, definitely wasn't going to say, hey, man, this ain't going to work for you on day one. But I knew from get-go, like, he, he he needs to hang out. He needs to socialize. And that's not my avatar for employees. Like, we we all socialize a lot throughout the day via text message and Zooms. But we don't probably once a month, maybe twice a month, we're actually face-to-face with each other. And then there's some guys that I haven't seen for three months now. And so they're perfectly fine with it. Go to the house, come to work, do their job, go to the house, perfectly fine with it. Everything's digital. They're a-okay with it. Other people, they need to have that social interaction. And I just know that that doesn't work for our, our company. Do your employees reside in multiple different states or all in the same state? Depends on the day of the week, really. What kind of mood I'm in and how many I fire. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, We're right on the border of Georgia and South Carolina. Currently, I just have one employee that lives in South Carolina, but it's not uncommon for us to have a couple people who will travel across state lines. One of my remote office staff. She lived in New York and that cost me an arm and a leg. I learned that one the hard way. Do not hire remote staff who live in New York state. It was a royal pain for me come tax time. New York is the only state that uh, we will not do business in. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, yeah. How, 
uh, how great the opportunity is. We've made a, we, we've drawn a line in the sand and we, we, we will not do business in the state of New York. We're not getting that truck. <laughs> You said no. You learned. You learned where your no was at, and that's yeah. it. Yeah, man. I got so many. So my, my wheels are spinning in so many directions right now. Where we can take this conversation? Why don't we just take a second here? Just pause for about thirty seconds, and uh, we'll hear a quick call to action, and then uh, we'll jump right back into things. Hey there, Tycoons. Austin Peterson here, co-host of Tycoons of Small Biz. If you think you have what it takes to be considered a tycoon and you're wondering how you could become a featured guest, please follow and then message us at Tycoons of Small Biz on LinkedIn. We'd love to have a conversation with you to see if it is a mutually good fit. And if so, we'll get you scheduled for an interview. If you're unsure about being a guest on our podcast, but are contemplating selling your business over the next few years and you'd like to know what your business is worth, Please also follow us and then message us on LinkedIn for your no obligation, informal valuation of your business. We look forward to hearing from you and thanks for listening to the Tycoons of Small Biz podcast. And now back to today's program. Switching gears maybe for a minute and obviously you've done this with with a number of your businesses, but something else that we find in kind of taking that leap and I'm sure with so many of the, the companies that you've helped grow is just how to really scale. And, and a lot of companies get stuck at a certain small level or or maybe even in the in the service business, you know, how do you break past two or three trucks? How do you get past, you know, that that point where the business owner can really have their hands almost physically on everything? What's maybe a key lesson or two that that you've learned as you've gone through that same process, really working your way through that business on how to how to break through that ceiling that that tends to really constrict a lot of businesses? Self-realization work on your ego. That's what stops you is your ego. And there's no other way to say it. I'd love to be nicer about it. But if you can't grow past a certain amount, it's it's your ego. That's putting it very easy, like short and sweet. But if you have to answer the phone call to solve the problem, you're the problem. You need to learn how to delegate. You need not delegate by abdication, but delegate, like create the process and delegate it and be done with it. Like the van, delegate the van, be done with it. If you want to hear some horror stories about delegation by abdication, I can give you those because I have definitely done that. But it's, you need to write down what you do every single day. When And it's a pain in the butt. I know it is a pain. Like I have these notebooks here where it's like, I was working a couple of years ago learning my circadian rhythm, which is, are y'all familiar with circadian rhythm? It's how your mind works when you're most productive during the day. So like there's two hours when you're really focused and artsy and you're, you're creative. And then you have other two hours a day where you're really analytical and you can really just focus on things. And when I say that, people will probably think, oh yeah, between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m., like I can rock and roll on some emails. Like I can just knock it all out. But if I try to do emails at 8 a.m., I'll get through one of them and just be, it'll be a, a blur the rest of the day. So I was working on trying to figure out my circadian rhythm. So every 15 minutes, I was writing down what I did. And I did that for two weeks straight, every 15 minutes. And I learned when I was the most productive, being creative and being, uh, you know, very analytical. It was a royal pain. But during that time, I also wrote down everything that I was doing in my processes, one of the ways that I really learned how to create processes that are almost bulletproof, not always bulletproof, but almost is to record the process that I'm doing and then send it to a VA, have them transcribe the process, give that once it's transcribed and the bullet points are written out, give that instruction to someone else, not you. Have that person follow the instructions wherever they stop record it again, send it to the VA, and then do it again. You'll probably do it three times with three different people, and then they can do the whole process because you do things without realizing you're doing it. And that's what you really have to do. You have to learn how to, and that might not be the best method for you. It might be best for you to handwrite every single process out for someone else to do. But you have to be able to do that. You have to create processes and procedures what to do in this scenario. Obviously, whenever you, you're at a million, you don't know what to expect at 3 million, but you know what you're doing every single day. So 
you, someone else can be doing what you're doing so that whenever you get to those those fires that you need to put out, you're there to do that. You're not doing the stuff that that the million uh, dollars an hour, a million dollar a year business owner is doing. So super interesting um, that you mentioned that. That's something that we talk a lot about, you know, with our clients, as I'm as I'm sure Ryan does as well. Tersh, I I started writing in a um, a, a book. So I had this book that was sitting on my bedside for not even sure how long, months or possibly years. Don't know where it came from. Don't know who it came from. Uh, but it was a, it's a book and it's a, it's a 90 day habit tracker. I, I've been making a lot of changes in my life, like this, this calendar year, more so than I ever have probably by 10 X in any other year. A lot of them are around habits. And a lot of that started after reading Atomic Habits by James Clear. So I started this habit tracker. And um, so it, it tracks, uh, I want to say, maybe 12 or 15 things. Your water intake, your exercising. <laughs> your, That's a tough one. Yeah, your intention for the day, your food, and, and, a, and a bunch of other really productive, great things to track. One of the things that's really hit me is my water intake for the day. As I have filled this out every day, like in the back of my head, I've always known, like, I know I don't drink enough water every day. I know that, uh, but never done anything about it. Uh, and that's because I have an inclination that I don't drink enough water, but I don't actually know whether I drink enough water or not because I'm not tracking it, right? And you can't measure what you don't track, right? right? And so it has been, again, this is only day number eight. And just scribbling in, in the little water glasses, you know, on this habit tracker every day and seeing, like, I can actually now visualize, like, okay, I should be drinking somewhere around, uh, I don't know. I, I think for my body weight and stuff, I should be drinking somewhere between 60 to 80 ounces of water per day. And I've averaged about 32 to 40 ounces of water per day. So I can actually visualize it now and say, okay, now I know I'm not drinking up water because I should be drinking at least 60 and I'm only drinking, you know, close to half of that, you know, per day. So it's so interesting the changes that you can make in your life and your business when you are actually writing them down and capturing them so that you can you know keep track of them but more importantly now you can measure them and then you can adapt and make changes you know as necessary um one of the guests that we had on early in our show um is a guy that has built a very successful business. The business is called uh, Trainual. Oh, and, yeah. Yep. And uh, he's based uh, out of Arizona. That's essentially what his business is, is helping mm -hmm. businesses capture their processes and their procedures uh, in this really cool and robust and modern platform so that people can, you know, can make, you know, great changes in their business. So that was actually, Trainual was one of the first platforms that I used uh, because I was trying to figure out, because I started doing everything remote in mm -hmm. 2017. And 2017, 18 doesn't seem like that long ago, but pre-pandemic, there was, it was very hard. You start talking cloud anything and everybody's like, what? No, we're not like security. Like I don't, and uh, what I actually ended up doing was I was already paying, and this is something that business owners need to really realize because it's so easy for us to subscription ourselves to death, but I was already paying for the Microsoft subscription, monthly subscription, and it had the ability, if you just spent some time learning how to do it, something similar, not quite as great as Tranual, not as pretty as Tranual, but it was enough for me to where I could build it all inside of, of SharePoint. And then I could share it through everybody's email addresses. Now, Tranual, I've revisited it since then, and it's really awesome. But now I'm so involved in 
the way the process I have now is like, oh, I, I just can't, I can't move back over to Tranual. But uh, I absolutely, that was a game changer for me because I thought that I was going to have to come pay for like Kajabi or something like that for internal use, which if you know what Kajabi is, it's a, it's an online course builder for professional course builders. So that meant I'd have to learn how to do this professionally and pay those kind of fees. And then Tranual came along and I was like, oh, this is a godsend. This is just amazing for me. But yeah, just solving that niche was, it was, I love that, that whole thought process. Back to your water solution, your water issue, um, <clears throat> a solution there that, that my, wife found because uh we did that same exact thing in 2018 2019 and she started buying these containers i want to call it a water jug that is uh every hour it tells you where you should you should have drank this much each hour and then refill and then drink it again and that's your daily intake uh secret on that when she goes to the bathroom because you when you're consuming that means 64, 30, you know, 100 ounces of water, whatever. You go to the restroom a lot. And if you just go in there and add like six ounces back to her cup every time she goes to the bathroom, oh, she gets firing mad. It's like, I'm drinking all day long and I just cannot drink this whole container. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it, man. Oh, that's, that's, that's amazing. I love that. I'm, I'm going to have to do that to my, my wife. She's a big, she's a big workout guru and a big water drinker. So I'll, I'll get, I could get her real good on that. But uh, yeah, that, that's so interesting, man. You know, I, I think there, there's two, two kinds of business owners and there is the business owner that is willing to do what you just described. And then there's the one that's not. And the one that's not is the one that will continue to bounce their head up and hit the ceiling over and over and over and over, right? Because and complain just, about it. Right. Because they're just not willing, they're just not willing to put that work in in order to to scale. I mean, so obviously to own multiple businesses, to have how many podcasts do you have? Two? Uh, two at the moment, yeah. Okay, so multiple businesses, multiple podcasts. You're a guest on other people's podcasts, you know, frequently. You're a speaker at events. You do a lot of stuff to give back to your to your industry. You give you do a lot of stuff to give back to your communities. There's only one way that you'd be able to, you know, physically do all of this stuff, and that is by removing yourself from the day-to-day -day operations of your businesses. And so one way that I can do what I do, uh, other than having an extremely supportive wife and kids who are amazing, and they just know as soon as like my door shuts and it says podcast on, they're silent. And so like, they're really good kids, but I've learned to say no <laughs> in the personal life. And we have personal, we have um, uh, life coaches. And one of the things that my wife and I, we were, we're people pleasers. Like I said earlier, we took on clients. We'd taken on clients. We knew we shouldn't have taken on because we were people pleasers. We wanted to make sure that they were taken care of. One of the things that, that our life coach told us, they're a husband and wife couple. And I actually had them on the podcast recently. Amazing episode. One of the things that they told us were, was our life is like a rubber band. You just, you can stretch that rubber band out and you can add one more thing to it because she's in the Air National Guard still. She's getting ready to be a major in nursing and she was a nurse full-time at the hospital and she was also a professor at Georgia Southern University and she would work part-time in the business as the medical, medical staff on duty, which by the way, if you have somebody that's a nurse, put them on your payroll and get the 20% uh, workman's comp discount because they're on staff medical, uh, medical, supervised medical on staff, whatever. And we had travel soccer. Two boys played travel soccer on two different travel teams. And we just kept stretching ourselves thinner and thinner. And they said, you're like a rubber band. You stretch a rubber band out so far, it just doesn't go back to the same 
same size that it was originally without some heat. Like you get some heat in there and, and compression, like maybe it's an, uh, an argument or maybe it's a mental breakdown or maybe it's a, hey, let's go visit some marriage counselors because I think our marriage is falling apart. That heat maybe will shrink that rubber band back. But what happens when you keep stretching it out and you like keep testing the boundaries and you're like, hey, we did this. We can do this. Oh, I was the president of a small business chamber. We were the on the executive board for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. We were on the board for other organizations. And she said, one day that's just going to snap. And that snap is your marriage. And that's all your personal relationships. And as business owners, it's very easy for us to just dive into the business and just let it snap and just blame the spouse on stress at work, blame work on the the stress at the home. But it's one of those things where you really have to learn to say no on Mondays. And it's the craziest thing because we spoke, Landon, it's probably been oof, two months ago now oh, yeah. since we spoke when we first were setting up this, this interview. Mm-hmm. I only work on the business on Mondays and Fridays. I work in the business on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I podcast on Wednesdays. Otherwise, I say no. And this is the only time I can remember not saying no. And that was because it was several months and we could plan it out. So it's very easy for me just to be like, oh, there's a networking event on Wednesday afternoon. I'm sorry, I podcast on Wednesdays. That's all I do. Oh, there's something on a Monday or a Friday. Sorry, I work on the business, not in the business. Now, if you want to network on a Tuesday or Thursday, I'll be there all day because I can work in the business at that point. So it's very easy to say no whenever you have very strict boundaries and you stick with them. And since 2018, I've podcasted every Wednesday. And then I work all all day on Wednesday on podcasting. Now, every now and then I will... If I have some free time, because podcasting really is a way for me to de-stress and because it comes so natural now because doing it for so many years that like if the business is stressing me out, one of the businesses, then I can come in here and I can play with a podcast episode or something like that. And it's like I'm not doing anything at all. Show my kids how to podcast. They all have microphone setups in their there's a den area. It used to be the man cave. Now it's the gaming area. They all have their own TVs. They all have their own microphone setups, just like I do. And so they can live stream and Twitch if they want to. Uh, and they ask me stuff and I'm like, Hey, yeah, I'll teach you all day long. I don't, obviously I don't want to throw it on you because this junk's expensive, but if you want to learn how to do it, I'd love to teach you how to do it. And that becomes kind of our family thing to do. And so, yeah, just circling back to learning how to say no and automation and and creating the processes and procedures. And when the processes and procedures aren't followed, you know it really. I mean, it's, oh, you're going to slack off on the process. I might not catch you this day. I might not catch you this week. But once we've reviewed it for a couple of weeks, it's very easy to pinpoint the process that fell apart. Church, I think that's I think that's really great advice. And we, we started this with saying saying no, but I think the importance of that that no being consistent throughout your day. And if you're just saying no in your personal life or just saying no in your business, something's still gonna break. Absolutely. Um, so I think that's that's really, really good advice, especially for that entrepreneur out there, because it's entrepreneurial family man is tough. And um, is. You, got, you gotta be choosy where you say no, but but you have to say no across the board. Um, or you're gonna let somebody down, including yourself. So that's that's great advice. Let me let um, me add something really fast to that, Ryan, if I can. Yeah. One of the things that my my life coach told me personally, he pulled me to this. We'll do like uh I'll work with John and and my wife Julie will work with Joe every now and then. And John pulled me to the side and he said, Look, man, I can just tell by your conversations because we'll do Zooms with like our kids are around too, because they want to see us interacting with kids and our kids and stuff. This has been several years ago, but man, this changed, changed the relationship that I have with all of my kids. I have four kids ranging from 14 to eight. Well, she'll be nine on Friday, this uh, this coming Friday. But I used to say, and, and John watched me do this. I say, hey, look, I'll as soon as I'm finished, I'll come and hang out with you. 
they they would run in the door at four o'clock from getting off the school bus or whatever. And I was on the I was on a Zoom or I was on a, a phone call with John, and I would like, hey guys, I'm on the phone. I'll I'll come, as soon as I'm done, I'll come back out there. And he was like, what you've done is you've set yourself up for failure. And I was like, are you serious? I thought I was super dad because I at least acknowledged them because used to I would ignore that their presence was there. And I said, at least I acknowledged their presence and told them I'd get back to them. He said, yeah, but you didn't tell when. You didn't set a definite expectation of when you're going to get back with them. And if you do get back with them, is your phone in your hand the whole time? Are you answering business calls? Because he, he was like, I challenge you to do this. And I was like, oh, man, John, If every time he challenged it, like he gave me a book that was like a thousand pages. And he was like, I challenge you to read this. And I was like, okay, great, John. Okay. And, and I'm not a fan of reading. Yes, I have dyslexia and a speech impediment. That's the main reason why I, I got up in front of people and started talking and, and reading. And, but he said, I challenge you to set a definite time and, and stick to it. And then whenever you're with them, say, hey, look, I'm in the middle of this call. It's 4.51 uh, p.m. Give me the next nine minutes and then I will come and I'll hang out with you for 30 minutes. And during that 30 minute period, for one, you better get off the uh, get off your call in nine minutes because they're watching that clock. And then for the next 30 minutes, they may not say anything, but they definitely are paying attention to that 30 minutes. And it changed every relationship that we had. Uh, we I started doing it with, my wife and I started doing it to each other. Um, and it's just, they know, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that just shows you, shows them how much you care about them. And we all say like, hey, look, I, why, why do you do your business? Like, why, why create this business? What's your goal? Nine times out of 10, you hear, it's for my family, to better my family, to make things successful for my family. And then to come to find out you've ignored your family, you, you know, not done anything helpful to the family. And then you don't do that intentionally. We don't, none of us do that intentionally, but you just get, you're good at being a business owner and that's where you really shine. And so it's like, all right, I'm just going to, I'm here ego to the max. This is where everybody really appreciates me. I get home and they're like, ah, blah, 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 you know, and they're just bombarded with negativity. Everybody here really just appreciates everything that I do. And so it's really easy just to just throw yourself even more into the business. But the more you show them appreciation, the more they respect and the more they respect you, the more you want to show them the appreciation. And it's just a, a, a vicious cycle of getting better and better. And now if my door shut, my kids don't even knock on the door. They don't do anything. They literally know that the moment I'm off of a call, I'll open my door up. And at that time, free reign, come see dad. That's amazing, man. <clears throat> I love that. You know, one of my, a buddy of mine, he's a, uh, an entrepreneur. He sold his business a couple of years ago and actually just acquired another, he bought a $5 million business, uh, just, just closed on it like two weeks ago with like almost eight months of, of due diligence on this, on this deal. Well done, Dennis. Him and I were having a conversation and I was talking to him about some of my plans and he said, look, what's most important to you? I want you to number it. One, two, three. What are the three things that are most important to you? And I, 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 I named them and he said, okay, let's reverse engineer. How much time do you spend on number one? How much time do you spend on number two? And how much time do you spend on number three? Yeah, let's just say uh, that was a an eye-opening exercise. The gut, the gut check. Yeah, a gut check. Absolutely, man, because what I named off as number one, I spent the least amount of time on. And right, you, you can imagine where that goes from there. So so that's really, really super interesting. And I, I love that piece of advice about being very specific. It's taken me 
many, many years, but my wife and I have an incredible relationship. Like we hardly ever fight, Mm -hmm. but when we do, it is because I tell her that I'm going to do this and that, and that I'm going to, I should walk out of my office at quarter after five. That puts me home at, you know, five, five thirty-five, five forty-five at the latest. And when I walk in that door at six o'clock in Mm -hmm. my mind, I'm only 15 minutes late and her mind is you broke your word. You said you would be home at five 45 at the latest and you came home at six o'clock. I don't care if it's 15 minutes later, you broke your word. And it's taken me a long time to, to figure that out, you know, because we look at it through such a different lens. Yeah. What you're saying is literally the conversation that John and I have, and and it's it's so wild how like we are across the country from each other, but we've done the exact same things, and it's that just goes to show you that it's the things that you're dealing with. If you are dealing with things, you're not alone. You're not the only person in the world that's ever dealt with this situation. Uh, men are who they are. Women are who they are. And they just think differently. And there's nothing wrong with it. You just understand. Put yourself in their situation, in their shoes, and uh, try your best to love language. Fill their love cup. Learn their love language and and do your best to fill that cup every single day. And I know we've gotten kind of off topic a little bit from entrepreneurial stuff, but this is really important. I mean, there are entrepreneurs out there who don't have families and man, and where I would be if I didn't have a kids that cost me hundred thousand dollars a year, I'd be rich because they cost me so much money. But <laughs> I told Julie that the other day, well, it's been a couple months ago. And she said, well, which one are you going to give up? I was like, not one of them. I couldn't dare give up one of them. But man, if I never had them to start with, I'd be rich. <laughs> well, let me, I want to throw something out real quick, Church. I want you to tell your kids this, okay? Landon, who has a podcast, told me to tell you guys that he wants you to go out and start a business. I don't care if it's a lemonade stand, a car washing business, a dog pick, pick poop pickup business. I don't care what it is, but you tell them they go out and start a business and run that business for 90 days. I will ha- I will bring them on to my podcast and interview them as a tycoon of small biz, all right? Oh man, I'm going to hold you to it cuz uh right. lawn, lawn and order is already uh they just started it. So <laughs> <laughs> They don't like pushing the mower, especially since I have a 72-inch zero turn radius. And they're like, "Dad, why can't we use that?" Because that's mine and this uh-huh. is yours. <laughs> so oh good. man i absolutely i will definitely tell them that though because they will they will eat that up 100 percent. looking forward to it well uh i know we're kind of at the top of the hour here church um to say i've, I've enjoyed this conversation is a is a gross understatement but just real quick man uh, people that want to find you online you know track you down reach out to you pick your brain whatever the case may be um how do you suggest they, they go about doing that? Honestly, you can Google Tersh, T-E-R-S-H, and I'm going to pop up, hopefully in a good way, um, or Service Business Mastery. Uh, that's the podcast. And we have a, an accountability small group that we've started up. And so if you want to be held accountable every single week, reach out and and uh, join that group. And it's awesome because it's a leverage for a nonprofit. So like if you... <laughs> If you don't meet your target that you set for yourself for the following week, you're going to donate $50 to this pool that we, at the end of the month, we give to a nonprofit. So yeah, it's, it's an accountability group that all we do is just say, Hey, what's your targets? And then we hold you accountable throughout the week. And so it's, it's a cool little pet project that we've had. It's a way for us to give back to the industry that's given us so much. And things like this, man, I really appreciate you having me on the show and spending the afternoon uh, together with y'all guys. Thanks for doing it on a non-Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, Church. Thanks a lot, brother. Really enjoyed the conversation and definitely 
looking forward to having you come on again sometime in the future as we kind of, you know, uh, continue to watch and follow your success and listen to your, uh, your uh, little nuggets of wisdom you're dropping man, because uh, a lot of really, really good stuff, business and personal. So I appreciate thank, you, thank you for making the time and we'll catch up with you soon. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, a podcast for small business owners by small business owners. Join us every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Arizona time for an introduction to another great tycoon. And be sure to follow us on our social media channels for links to all of our episodes and great content.